Okay, hello again. Here's your absolute last video of the semester. Uh, thank you for putting up with this very, very weird semester. The world we're living in is very weird today, and I genuinely hope to see some of you in the future in person. Uh, one note before I get started with this video, if you plan on being with us in the fall, go ahead and sign up for those classes as soon as you can. Uh, we're trying to figure out how many classes to offer in person versus how many classes to offer online. So we need you signing up for for next semester to find out what we do and don't need. But without further ado, here is European exploration. I'll try to make it quick for you since I'm doing the extra video today. All right, first thing you have to know that Europe in the 1400s was no different than it was in Roman days. Uh, they knew the same thing about the earth they did in Roman days. It took just as long to sail from one end of Europe to the other as it did in Roman days. And there was no sea traffic between northern and southern Europe. But by 1500, all of that has changed. The 1400s is a huge time of just exploration. Now, the reasons for exploration, there's going to be a question about this on the final exam. So I really want you to know that population is not a factor. The Black Plague had just killed 50% of all the Europeans. There is plenty of room for everybody. Uh, the biggest reasons are the national governments. Uh, National governments are getting stronger. Secular leaders are getting stronger. They're wealthy enough to fund big expeditions. If you don't have a strong government, you're not exploring. That's why you don't hear about those German explorers, because Germany didn't exist. Uh, you don't hear about those Russian explorers, because Russia didn't have a strong government at that point. You also have scarce items, things like spices and silk and cotton. They're all highly valuable. Pepper, from my research, is worth the most, and it's like $12,000 for 100 pounds. Now, I don't know why you need 100 pounds of pepper, but if you buy that today, you can get it off Amazon for less than $500. There's also the Renaissance. Uh, people are more willing to question things and explore things. And then there's that whole love of the antique writings. And... Something called Ptolemy's geography is discovered when they're going back and looking through ancient writings. And Ptolemy uh, drew a map of the, of the world. Uh, only he left out the United States, of course, and he left out South America because it didn't exist in their eyes. So the, this map of the world ended up showing the world about, I think it's 5,000 miles smaller than it really was. We also have some new inventions, uh, the sand glass, better known as the hourglass, so they could tell time, the magnetic compass, so they knew north, the astrolabe, so they could figure out how far east and west they were, and then the caravel is going to be a brand new type of sailing ship that could be sailed by as little as five to ten men. Now your first explorers are the Portuguese. There's a guy named Prince Henry who opens up this navigation school. And he's going to teach others how to use uh, the astrolabe and the magnetic compass and how to sail. Uh, these Portuguese ships are going to sail down the coast of Africa. They're going to get control of the gold trade. And then a man named Vasco da Gama is going to sail to India in 1497. He's the first European to sail to Asia. And he makes a 600% profit even after... Uh, paying for his trip where he loses a bunch of ships and he loses a bunch of men. He has to pay their, the cost of the journey. He has to pay all the, the sailors. Even after the expenses are taken out, he makes a 600% profit. And then those Jesuits I talked about in that last video, they're going to spread Christianity to China, Japan, Vietnam, and all over the place. Spanish explorers, these are the ones you, that you probably know a little bit better. Uh, first of all, you got Christopher Columbus. Uh, I'm sorry to break your heart, he did not discover America. America was here the entire time, and other people had been here before him. The Vikings had been here. Leif Erikson and his son, Eric the Red. I have that backwards. Eric the Red and then his son, Leif Erikson. There's even evidence and a rumor that an Irish monk named Brendan had already sailed to North America and back again. Uh, but what we do know is Christopher Columbus, he was an Italian hired by Spain to try and sail to China. And he lands in the Bahamas in October of 1492. He never realizes that he has landed on the continent of North America. 
he goes to his deathbed thinking he's, he's off the coast of China. Uh, he does locate all the major Caribbean islands, though, and um, he's not a very good guy. Um, if you read one of the readings for this week, um, you'll see what type of person Christopher Columbus really was. You got Ferdinand Magellan. His ship, not him, but his ship is the first ship to go around the world. Um, Ferdinand Magellan, he doesn't make it back to Europe. Uh, he dies in the Philippines in a fight. Um, and then you got the conquistadors. You got Hernan Cortez, who conquers the Aztecs. You got Francisco Pizarro, who's going to conquer the Inca. You got Ponce de Leon, who's going to search for the Fountain of Youth. Now, where are the consequences of exploration? Well, you got the Portuguese, and they're going to develop the caravel. And I got a picture of a caravel up there in the top right corner. That's your traditional three three sail ship it's got three masts um you could sail that with you know about 10 people it's much more efficient use of manpower and it had to be because 50 percent of the population is dead because of the black death there's a huge amount of gold and silver that's going to enter europe between 1500 and 1650 um, if this was in person we would be doing the exact calculations to find out but we're going to roughly say it's $18.6 billion worth of gold and silver is brought into Europe. And that destroys the, the markets in Europe. Uh, there are these huge price increases because of the inflation. The money is almost worthless in, in Europe, especially in Spain. And then you have this de development of glass windows, uh, pure clear glass windows which leads you to uh, telescopes and leads you to microscopes and it leads you to you know being able to look out your bedroom window a huge um, side effect is the slave trade slave trade probably more than anything else has affected our world and it's still affecting our world today I mean just look at what's happening in the news in the past month there's this huge democratic demographic shift not just in Africa but in the entire New World um, when you look at where most of these slaves went Brazil gets 40 percent of the slaves in fact the average lifespan of a slave in Brazil is 24 entire social systems in Africa are going to collapse there's this horrible gender imbalance which leads to famine and warfare and a lot of the slaves are captured by African natives and then sold to Europeans. And almost as quickly as this European slave trade pops up, there's controversy around it. It's seen as inhumane, while others argue that it's an economic necessity. And a lot of this slave trade that starts with the Portuguese in the 13 and 1400s still affects our life today. The second most important thing that's going to happen out of the European exploration period is the Columbian Exchange. And it's this transfer of biological materials between the old world and the new world. Uh, some of this transfer is intentional, some of it's unintentional. Now one of the things that is exchanged is food. Uh, there's this strange crop, you've probably never heard of it, called the potato. It's originally found in South America. It's brought to Northern England. It's brought to Ireland. It's brought to Northern Germany where it grows very well. And it becomes the most important crop in Europe by the 1800s. Now, a side note, when the potato first came to England and to Germany, it was thought to be the devil's food because the potato is not mentioned anywhere in the Christian Bible. Another important food, uh, there are new types of fish discovered off the coast of Canada. And then there's the tomato. If you have ever had anything Italian, whether it be um, pizza to spaghetti to whatever it might be, the tomato was originally from Central America. And it comes to Italy where it becomes very important to Italian cuisine. Uh, the people of Italy had never seen anything like it. And so the Italian word for tomato is pomodoro which means golden apple. You got corn. Corn is seen as the miracle crop. It's originally from Central America and South America. 
and uh, where it's better known as maize. And the reason it's so important is for every one kernel of corn that was planted, you get 70 kernels back. And it's very efficient at feeding people, and it starts to fill up the table in Europe. And then you got sugar. Sugar is not really a food, but I'm putting it with this. Uh, sugar is going to replace honey. Uh, at the time that sugarcane is discovered in the New World, there's a collapse in the honeybee population. And sugar is going to fill that sweet tooth that honey used to. And then slavery is going to expand because uh, a lot of the slaves are going to be brought to the New World to work in sugar plantations. Drinks. Chocolate. Chocolate was originally a drink. It was originally from Central America, and it becomes a delicacy in Europe. And now you can find chocolate everywhere. Coffee was originally from the Middle East, but it was found to grow very well in South America. And coffee plantations were set up in Central and South America, and coffee becomes extremely important, especially to the British Empire. And in fact, you could say the British Empire is uh, built on coffee and tea. Tea is originally from India and China. <clears throat> it's found to grow extremely well in South America in almost the same climates as coffee. And the biggest difference, <clears throat> excuse me, coffee was seen as a drink for men. Tea was seen as a drink for women. And the tea trade is going to be probably more important to the British Empire than coffee is. But all three of those drinks are a product of this Colombian exchange. And they got disease. There was no immunity to European diseases in the Americas. And smallpox, influenza, cowpox, measles, mumps, pneumonia. Those are six things that Europeans had dealt with for years. And when they come to the Americas, it's a 90% plus death rate. Today, you know, we're like measles, mumps, got shots for those pneumonia ah, people get it and they take some some medicine for it no it's not like that back then uh, the flu we talk about the flu all the time but before those diseases came to the new world it was a 90 percent death rate once it got here now historians estimate that the pre-european population in north and south america was about 30 million by 1650, which is about 150 years after Europeans got there, it's down to 5 million people. It's, it's a horrific death rate. Now, there is one disease that went from the, old, the New World back to the Old World, and that was syphilis. Uh, syphilis was, had never been seen in the Old World until colonization. Now, I'll leave you this one last thing here, uh, cooking styles. Um, there are a couple of cooking styles that are a creation of this, this uh, exploration. One is barbecue. Barbecue was originally a cooking technique used by uh, native groups on the island of Hispaniola. And what would happen is uh, the, the Carib group, or the Carib native group, they would smoke meat over this green wood, over a fire, the Caribs called it Boucan, the French called it Boucanier, the English called it Buccaneer, and the Spanish called it Barbaco. And that's where we get our word barbecue from. Another one, and I, I'm sorry if this sounds like a stereotype, it's actually not. Um, fried meats, especially fried chicken, was brought to the New World by African slaves. And fried chicken is some of the best stuff in the world. Okay, so... No secret word for this video because I've already given you two. Uh, there was one on Monday and then there was one in the uh, Reformation video. So no secret word here. The last thing I want to leave you with is make sure you get your research paper done by Sunday. You also have the reflection paper, which shouldn't take you that long to do. Um, there's no quiz this week because I want you to focus on those two things. And then next week is your research, or, sorry, not research paper. Next week is your final exam and your museum review. Uh, museum review, if you're curious, about three pages. It's double the length of a reflection paper. You can use any of those online museums I've posted in Blackboard, or you can watch any of those movies you've posted in Blackboard. Um, 
If you are choosing to do an extra credit museum review, make sure that is also due on the 26th. You will email the extra credit museum review to me directly. So everybody has to submit one museum review. If you do a second one, email the extra credit to me. All right, once again, it's been a pleasure. I'm sorry we didn't get to see each other in person. Uh, we made the best of it, though. Uh, hopefully the world is a different place in the fall. Uh, but stay safe, and uh, we will see you around. Thank you. Bye-bye.